Well, the Amazon rainforest is dying, literally going up in smoke, which you know is pretty bad and depressing, but what does this mean for the planet as a whole? What will become of this whole dark green part of South America? Can the Amazon rainforest even be saved? Hello everybody, this is Ecotasia, and behind me is the Amazon rainforest. And as you might realize, I am wearing a beanie and a jacket because I am cold. <laughs> Very cold. I mean, last night, my first night sleeping in the Amazon rainforest, I was under a big, thick blanket. Uh, what's happening is a weather condition known as a... Well, hello. Welcome to the editing room. Anyway, I need to interject my NC2 footage because I went full Utah and continually mispronounced friaje, a South American weather phenomenon where cold air from Antarctica goes north across South America in the southern hemisphere's winter and can cause pretty substantial cold snaps all the way up to the equator. Friajes usually bring about three days of intense cold and are generally uncommon as far north as the Amazon, but when I was there I experienced one every two weeks, which was highly unusual. Anyway, back to the Amazon to finish that intro after editing around all the times I said Friaje wrong. I thought this was an interesting phenomenon because I was really interested in talking about the Amazon and global climate and how the Amazon is changing due to deforestation primarily. Tierra firme in the Amazon basin, some of the most famous collections of trees on earth. These are ancient old growth forests that have not seen disturbance in a long, long time and so have an open understory as the ancient canopy trees absorb much of the light far above the leaf-littered ground. The distinctive call of the screaming piha pierces the still air. Untouched, this is the home of the Amazon basin's largest and longest-lived tree, the constania, also known as the Brazil nut. From the ground, the trunk ascends straight up to the canopy above, where the tree's great branches burst above the surrounding sea of green as a mighty emergent. Up here, large bees pollinate flowers that become the strange fruit of this tree over a maturation process that takes more than a year, at which time the ripe fruit breaks free and plummets from the sky like a cannonball. The outside is very hard, and only one animal in the forest has the teeth to get in, the agouti, a large rodent. The agouti gnaws a hole in the fruit to extract the seeds. The now hollow fruit sometimes will fill with water, and become a secret, hidden pool various insects and even poison frogs use as a nursery, just some of the many species that are linked to this keystone tree species. The agouti takes off with the constania's seeds and caches them for later. For the agouti, caching so many seeds means it is inevitable they either never get around to coming back, or just forget exactly where the food is buried. Wish I only ever misplaced snacks and not my car keys or wallet. Agouti are also small, tasty, and defenseless, perfect prey for any number of jungle predators. Thus, many Brazil nut seeds are left buried throughout the forest, waiting. Eventually, the canopy tree above will grow old and fall, leaving an opening for a new tree to fill, and if lucky, one of these seeds long lost by an agouti can claim that spot. But now a new sound drifts in over the insect buzzes and bird calls. The modern world has arrived here in the depths of the Amazon rainforest in the form of chainsaws. It is one thing to be told as a kid in school or in some animated TV program or as an adult on the news or some YouTube video that their rainforest is disappearing, which usually makes the loss of forest nothing more than a statistic from a distant continent. You know, like, oh yeah, the Amazon rainforest is being cut down. That's so sad. However, it is entirely different to actually stand in the Amazon and hear the march of the global economy across the river. Watch the smoke of a fire in the distance and actually see forest cover disappear as the ancient trees are cleared away. In this part of Amazonia, people make a living by prospecting for gold in the bends of rivers. Most miners are paid commission based on how much gold they find, and since gold sells for about $1,300 to $2,000 an ounce, this offers a way out of extreme poverty that has resulted in quite a bit of migration to the region. To get the gold, the forests are cut down and a big pit is dug. The sediments are then run through a sluice to separate out the denser gold from silt and other minerals. The gold is then dissolved in mercury to remove impurities, and then this mixture is heated up to boil away the mercury, leaving behind pure gold. That mercury, though, doesn't just go away. It precipitates into the environment and taints it. 
The river, the fish, the wildlife, and the people here now all have elevated mercury levels. This gold mine is just one of thousands of human pressure points across the Amazon basin. Beyond mines, there's also logging, oil drilling, slash and burn agriculture, and tourism operations. Alone, most are small and pretty insignificant, but together they have the potential to break the rainforest. The Amazon is changing, forests are being cut down or burned, animals are disappearing or scrounging through human rubbish, like this ocelot that came out of the forest to eat from a compost pile. A composolot. Come on, that joke is at least worth a like. This is going to be a not super upbeat video. We're talking about the collapse of the most biodiverse place on Earth. Gotta get some humor in here somehow, so this isn't just sad. Rainforests like the Amazon, especially the old growth Tierra Firme forests, generally act as carbon sinks, which to help explain, I have brought in some outside help from Roche over on All About Climate. Thanks Ecotasia, it's a pleasure to be on your channel. Carbon sinks are essentially environments that take more carbon out of the atmosphere than they put into it. So for example, while rainforests do produce some CO2 through processes like respiration, on balance they absorb far more through processes like photosynthesis. Crucially, much of the carbon they absorb is then stored in soils or in long-lived trees for centuries at a time. And because CO2 is a greenhouse gas, this absorption and storage of carbon from the air makes rainforests and other carbon sinks, like the ocean, very important parts of the climate system, something which I've covered in depth on my channel. But just how much carbon can a rainforest store? Well, let's take the Amazon as an example. Covering over 5 million square kilometres, the Amazon contains something like 120 billion tonnes of carbon, which is around 20% of all the carbon stored in plants on the planet. Now that might sound like a lot, and it is, but 120 billion tonnes is roughly 10 times the amount of carbon that human civilization produces every single year. That's right, at the current rate of emission, it will take us just 10 years to burn the equivalent of an entire Amazon's worth of fossil fuels. Pretty scary. But remember, the Amazon and other rainforests don't just store carbon, they also absorb it, helping to mitigate some of the CO2 that we produce. In fact, the Amazon alone absorbs about 400 million tonnes of carbon every year, which is equivalent to about 4% of global emissions, or roughly the amount that Russia produces annually. Clearly then, rainforests, and by extension trees, are important for regulating the balance of gases in the atmosphere. And the best trees for absorbing and storing carbon are the giant tropical hardwoods. This is why it is so important to protect these old growth hardwood trees from deforestation. Because although other faster growing trees can replace them when we cut them down, these trees are usually hollow, a property that allows for their speedy growth but reduces the amount of carbon that they can store. This means that once the old growth trees are cut, the rainforest's ability to store carbon is significantly reduced. And to make matters worse, the process of deforestation often releases the carbon stored in trees into the atmosphere as they are burned to clear land. As we speak, this process is turning parts of the Amazon from a carbon sink into a carbon source, an area that releases more carbon into the air than it absorbs. And on top of all of that, deforestation also has ecological effects on the areas that remain intact. For example, it exposes the trees near the deforestation edge to powerful winds that can cause them to fall down, where they decompose and release even more CO2. And it can also create drier microclimates, making the remaining forest even more vulnerable to fire and releasing yet more CO2. Vegetation in the rainforest, though, not only sequester carbon from the atmosphere, but in the same photosynthetic process that binds carbon from CO2 into sugars, water vapor is released, which greatly influences the local climate of the Amazon. As a rainforest, it generally rains a lot in the Amazon, enough to feed the largest river system on Earth. Around 75 to 65 percent of the rain that falls in the Amazon comes from water that evaporates off the Atlantic and is then blown west across South America. 
The other 25 to 35 percent of rain comes from water released by all the plants in the Amazon as a byproduct of photosynthesis, and then recondenses and precipitates back down on the forest. Thus, the Amazon rainforest helps create a substantial part of the rainy climate that sustains all that vegetation in a positive feedback loop. More green, more rain, more green, more rain, and thus support all the life of the Amazon, from the colorful to the unusual. The issue is that this feedback loop can be reversed. If more vegetation means more rain, then less vegetation because the trees get cut down means less precipitation. And if rainfall were to fall enough, this could cause a rapid dieback of the Amazon. But hey, it's only like a quarter to a third of the water. It isn't like the whole planet's climate is undergoing some sort of rapid shift that could change rainfall regiments and starve the Amazon of more water. Oh. Oh, wait. So what climate change will actually change about the local climate in any given area is kind of complicated to predict. But following what current trends are showing, it seems that climate change is causing the climate of the Amazon to be more variable, with a trend towards less rain, which will result in the area experiencing some droughts. Over the coming decades, this trend is projected to cause the basin-wide annual average of 1,800 millimeters of precipitation today to drop to 1,100 millimeters in the 2040s and be reduced to 800 millimeters by the 2070s. This points to the Amazon rainforest really experiencing high stress in the mid to late 21st century, which would set the stage for the predicted dieback of the Amazon rainforest. I got to experience some of this variability in the Amazon with that high number of Friaje events which usually came with one heavy rain, followed by several chilly, rainless days. The number of these events, however, from my understanding, was quite unusual. Even without precipitation shifts, as not all models suggest a dramatic decline in rainfall, increasing average temperatures will stress the forest by drying out the soil, which will result in the same decline in access to water for plants of Amazonia. The first part of the rainforest, which is already experiencing this climate change-driven stress, is the southeastern Amazon, which is the part of the basin, if you remember, has begun switching from a carbon sink to a carbon source. The effects of climate change seem to be reversing a geologically recent expansion of the Amazon into this region over the past few thousand years. High levels of atmospheric CO2 are a double-edged sword for trees like the Constania. Abundant CO2 actually favors trees over plants like grasses because they fix carbon for photosynthesis slightly differently. However, increased temperatures speed up the biochemistry and result in more transpiration. So they need more water, which due to less precipitation and the warmer temperature is harder to come by. While they can survive short-term drought, after about three years of severe drought, large trees will begin to die. However, intact forest could resist drought pretty effectively, and the Amazon rainforest would continue to persist through a combination of the long lifespans of trees and some precipitation variability forcing the forest to adapt to drier conditions without outright killing all the trees at least into the 22nd century, when hopefully people care more about reversing climate change and curse their incompetence and trying to mitigate and adapt today. But notice I said intact forest has some ability to survive drought. We humans are not exactly keeping the Amazon rainforest intact, are we? So remember when I said small areas of human disturbance like this gold mine pit have the ability to break the rainforest? These tiny spots of human activity while infinitesimally small compared to the entire basin, act as thousands and thousands of pressure points. Because with human encroachment comes the one thing that could destroy the stressed forests, fire. While many forests around the world have adapted to fire regimens, and some even require fire to reproduce, the wet conditions the Amazon has developed in meant fire was incredibly rare. Until now. Until us. The old growth giants like the Constania are helpless if a blaze begins as they have no adaptation to fire, except growing in a place that usually just doesn't catch on fire. But with less rainfall and higher temperatures, they can more easily burn, especially when humans stoke the flames. Even areas not burned feel the effects of the fires, which fragment the forest and subject vegetation to edge effects. With less plant life, less water enters the atmosphere through transpiration, and so less rain falls. Thus, the forests get drier and dies more rapidly. It is human disturbance in a climate-stressed forest that will cause the predicted mass dieback of the Amazon. But what will that look like? And how will that affect the region as well as the rest of the world? 
Let us travel into the depressing future of a post-Amazon rainforest world. Fragmented by wildfires and devastated by increasing temperatures along with declining precipitation, the mighty Amazon basin will reach a tipping point where the most biodiverse rainforest on Earth will be reduced to a low biodiversity, low biomass scrub habitat. This process is already starting in the southwestern extent of the Amazon, which is heavily deforested, speeding up a process climate change alone could have eventually pushed. But from here, following the path of human pressure points, the Amazon will die back. The loss of biomass and productivity leading to a feedback loop where less water is released through transpiration and further dries out the basin, leading to more fire, which fragments and kills off more of Amazonia. While some of the basin's iconic large animal species might be able to survive in this new scrub landscape, much of the more specialized, smaller species will perish, a cataclysmic regional extinction event of primates, birds, amphibians, insects, plants, and much of what makes the Amazon so alive. These changes, though, will also have dramatic impacts on the people who live in the Amazon, especially in the face of climate change, which the Amazon rainforest could have been a critical part of adaptation to. Without the forest, droughts will be more severe, and access to water could become a real problem, especially if the water is tainted by poisons like mercury due to mining or sewage due to insufficient sanitation. Similarly, rising temperatures will increase decomposition, which will more rapidly use up nutrients in the soil and make farming more difficult than it is even today. The loss of local biodiversity will also have its effects on the local community. With high biodiversity also comes high pathogen and parasite diversity. In a stable ecosystem, these generally do what they do and don't spill over into humans, but say if predators decline and are not eating the sick prey animals, disease becomes more prevalent and more likely to jump to other species in the area, including people. The large fires that are fracturing the Amazon and releasing large amounts of carbon into the air will also be directly dangerous to people. All the biomass burning will result in particulate matter being sent into the air. This, along with the release of dust from deforested areas, will result in a dramatic loss of air quality, which will directly impact human health. Already, respiratory diseases have increased dramatically in the southern Amazon as the forest disappears. Additionally, the burning will result in increased rates of soil-transmitted worm diseases and cancer in the people of the Amazon. While the local communities will take the brunt of the worst effects, the death of the Amazon will have ripples throughout the world. As a massive forest that acts as a vast carbon sink, even a partial dieback will have dire consequences greatly reducing the biosphere's uptake and storage of carbon which for some reason we keep on adding to the atmosphere. Stressed trees and the loss of the Amazon's overall extent will lead first to a loss of primary productivity, or rate at which the sun's energy is converted into organic molecules. By 2050, the forest is predicted to have a decline in productivity of 52%. Productivity directly relates to how much CO2 trees take up and their effectiveness as a carbon sink, and so more of the CO2 we release into the air stays in the air. Beyond the importance of the Amazon as a carbon sink, the transpiration in the rainforest does not only have an impact on the precipitation in Amazonia, and so loss of forest can affect rainfall patterns on other parts of the planet. There is a correlation between deforestation in the Amazon and declining precipitation to the north up in Central America. While correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation, there is a climate mechanism that suggests loss of forest cover in the Amazon causes declines in rainfall to the north. But the effects on global precipitation don't just end here. Models suggest deforestation in the Amazon correlates to declining precipitation over the Gulf of Mexico in August, and then the Indian Ocean in October. The mechanisms here are a little more difficult to explain, but if rounding out the inconsequential effects of a drunk morpho butterfly completely changes the results of a weather model, the loss of one of the largest forests on Earth will have some chaotic and far-reaching effects that we cannot even begin to predict. Unfortunately, despite the fear of the unknown being deeply ingrained, saying no one is quite sure how this will turn out has been pretty ineffective at getting anything meaningful done about climate change. But is this our inevitable future? Will the only thing left of the Amazon rainforest be the Rainforest Cafe and Amazon.com? Isn't it telling that Googling Amazon only gives you stuff linked to Amazon.com and not the rainforest or river that inspired that name? 
or the Greek mythology the name is originally derived from. Sorry, that has just annoyed me for like ever. You have to add extra keywords to not just get the online superstore. Forming just a few million years after the end of the Cretaceous mass extinction, the Amazon has existed for a long time and withstood the many climatic shifts of the Cenozoic. This forest is adaptable and resilient, traits that many organisms here also share, like our friend the Composolot. You could say it is sad a beautiful jungle cat is rummaging in a pile of human scraps, but that shows this animal is resourceful, and the ocelot is not alone. What's moving this tree at night in the middle of the unnatural clearing our research station is in? <gasps> a troop of night monkeys coming to forage on ripe fruit. These cute little night gremlins actually do all right in disturbed areas despite their secretive nature. So it seems that perhaps humans and the rainforest can coexist, and the Amazon rainforest doesn't have to die. When I was writing about how the loss of the Amazon could cause rainfall declines in Central America, I remembered that many of Costa Rica's spectacular and biodiverse tropical forests, such as Carrara National Park and Corcovado National Park, are not true rainforests like the Amazon, but moist and wet forests, respectively. This shows that even with less rain, a biodiverse tropical forest can thrive. We just need to keep the Amazon from burning and becoming scrub. The dieback of the Amazon is a very distinct possibility, and so actions have to be taken to find ways of solving the problems leading to the forest's decline and ensure that there are contingencies if we fail. The loss of the Amazon rainforest would be a pretty significant extinction event, as around a tenth of the world's biodiversity inhabits the basin. The best way to make sure we don't lose all these organisms is to ensure that they have a chance to leave areas that are dying back, as even if most of the Amazon were to go, lush rainforests would remain along the foothills of the Andes, and act as a refugia for all that life until we figure out how to live on this single finite planet or civilization collapses, after which the forest could one day expand from these climatic refuges. This calls for creating wildlife corridors between the largest remaining sections of undisturbed Amazon rainforest and the base of the Andes. Paths wildlife can take safely. Ensuring the worst case doesn't happen, and Amazonian biodiversity won't need to retreat to Andean refuges as the rainforest completely dies back will be a global effort. While the deforestation happens locally and will affect local communities the most, make no mistake, the deforestation is driven by global pressures with the global north's insatiable appetite for raw materials and meat at the center of it. Around 75% of the land cleared in the Amazon is turned into pasture for cattle. After cows are raised on the cleared land and slaughtered, the beef enters a highly complex global supply chain that means the origins get lost, and so many companies that buy from the region and sell beef and leather products in the United States and Europe cannot confidently say whether the product came from areas cleared illegally. As the ultimate consumers of these products, the global north is driving the deforestation. But this also gives consumers a tiny bit of power to demand better. When consumers become aware of the destruction, sometimes, on the rare occasion, companies they buy from can be lobbied to sell them rainforest-friendly products, which means companies demand their suppliers only to buy from areas that are not newly deforested. These moratoriums on purchasing products from newly deforested areas do have an effect. In Brazil, both beef and soy, soy usually being exported as feed for livestock across the globe, have such moratoriums in place, and it seems since then deforestation has slowed. Though of course has not stopped, and there are ways meat and soy from illegally deforested areas still work their way into the global market. Similarly, there are attempts to clean up gold supply chains through NGOs like the Amazon Aid Foundation. Halting deforestation, though, is only a small part of the problem that keeps the Amazon from catastrophically dying back. The global north is also responsible for the whole climate change thing that is going to stress the forest to the point of being susceptible to such a collapse. As a natural carbon sink, intact Amazon rainforest is a powerful natural ally to get all that extra CO2 out of the air, and we really need to cut back emissions to give the forest a chance to store it. One thing that kind of takes care of both is just not buy any beef or soy from the Amazon. You know, purchase as local as possible, as that should take a whole lot less fossil fuels to transport it to a completely different hemisphere. However, your small actions are not going to translate into market shifts, and there is little evidence that things can actually be changed by conscientious consumers, probably because that is an oxymoron. But I need to give you some call to action that makes you feel like you're helping, maybe. 
Like and subscribe. That's also a call to action. It is, however, most important to remember that people in the Amazon basin still need to make a living. They need to grow crops and raise meat for their own consumption. Right, you cannot solve deforestation in the Amazon without taking into account local economic and social aspects. Gold miners digging through monumental amounts of alluvial deposits dream of finding a bunch of gold and making it out of poverty, something that formal employment in the region probably couldn't give them. So it can be quite tricky to try and clamp down on it. I was told any time the government tried to shut down gold mines, the miners, as the main part of the economy in the region, would shut down the local economy and force the government to admit defeat and go away. This highlights the conservation challenges and why solving the problem will take more holistic approaches. The other thing to remember is that humans have inhabited the Amazon rainforest for thousands of years and so are part of the ecosystem. While there are places that are virgin rainforest with less of a history of long-term human habitation and thus should be preserved with limited human disturbance, other parts are growing atop the remnants of farms, towns, and cities. These areas should have more complex management that can involve human habitation without messing up the ecology. It is from the more ancient people of the Amazon perhaps people today can learn to exist within the rainforest. Throughout Amazonia, there are these unusual deposits of incredibly rich soils. This is unusual as though the rainforest topsoil is rich, it quickly deteriorates if not continually replenished by the forest. And so when the forest is cut down for agriculture, the soil becomes unusable after a few years. However, these rich soils, terra preta, were created by people and have existed for centuries. They exist in deposits ranging from about 20 to 350 hectares and not only have more nutrients, but are better at retaining moisture. They were made by mixing charred, not completely burnt, vegetation and wood from low heat fires for cooking, then mixed with various scraps and waste. So it is basically a compost mix. Hey, the Composolot returns! Anyway, Terra Preta is very nutrient rich and stable, retaining all these properties since their abandonment when the Spaniards showed up looking for gold and a place to commit genocide a few hundred years ago. Because terra preta is formed from charred vegetation and not charcoal, the process actually acts as a potential carbon sink, and so if terra preta farming returned, it could also keep the Amazon as an important carbon sink, while also growing a lot of food. The ancient people of the Amazon were able to support vast cities through this method. Another potential way to conduct agriculture in the Amazon sustainably is no-till alley farming, where alleys of crops are grown in between hedgerows of natural vegetation, especially leguminous trees, which fix nitrogen and so regenerate the soil nutrients. These are but two simple farming solutions to allow people to both make a life for themselves and also keep the world's largest rainforest intact. So I guess the Amazon is dying, but doesn't have to. I would like to have some big call to action like reduce your consumption of meat or don't buy gold, but in reality, ensuring a future the Amazon still exists in is more nuanced, and there is not much any individual can do about it. Though that is not to say individual action is unimportant, it is, just on its own, won't fix the world. There are plenty of NGOs fighting the good fight, like the Amazon Aid Foundation or the Amazon Conservation Association, and I implore you to check out their websites. You could always spread the word and be that annoying environmentalist always talking about the climate crisis, the loss of rainforest, and how they are intertwined. Or you could always share this video on social media. So yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts on how we can save the Amazon rainforest. Anyway, make sure you check out more of Rosh's amazing work on All About Climate. If you want to learn more about climate science, as well as debunking of climate change skeptics' claims, he makes great stuff you are going to really enjoy.